of the mic. There we go. And turn on the microphone. So, okay, that's working. That's good. All right. Oh, this is the other thing over the weekend. You know, I well, okay, I go to Amazon all day long to kind of look at things. Window shopping, virtual window shopping, right? And I found um, they make these portable um, UHF based um, PA public announcement you know, systems. So in the, in the classroom without a speaker system like this, you know, I think it's actually viable to bring my own little loudspeaker thing so that you know, I have, still have a wireless mic on me, but then I can walk around and the um, level at the mic would stay about the same. So I think that can be done, but it's kind of cool. I can't, uh, I, I probably cannot explain to my wife why I need one, but <laughs> yes? Well, it's not a toy. I mean, it really is a useful tool. Okay, there we go. You know, this is one thing that I really don't like with these classrooms is you know the way they place the projector. So that is definitely um, in the specification of the new building. Is you know the screens that they have to be placed uh, correctly. One thing they're going to do is they will increase the ceiling height of classrooms. So that means the screen, the projection screen, is going to be higher up. Um, so hopefully that will help you uh, remove this problem. And then the other thing that might be done, you know, some people really do not like the idea, is to have tiered furniture. So instead of having your flat furniture, where we all, you guys all sit at the same level, which is the problem, okay, which is why the people in the back cannot see you know, the lower portion of the screen, the, the furniture will be tiered. So people you know, sitting in the back will be sitting on the, on the stool and the workbench or the table will be higher. Okay, so that's, you know, there are no options. So, uh, yeah. Well, would it be easier to use the uh, table that are actually at um, the adjustable Depends on the price of everything. You know, so you can have the adjustable floor, so the floor itself can go up and down, but that, that that's not going to lend itself to reconfiguring the classroom, you know, into different configurations. No, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not yeah, the adjustable ones are much more expensive, and they're also heavier as well. Yeah, so, yeah because that's what we have at basically the new building that we're getting for my current At Sac State? No, um, for, my, for, my, for, my, for my current work for the state. Do they need to move the furniture, like, frequently? No. No, not necessarily. That's the, that's the issue, because this one is, you know, it's, it, it's pretty solid. But, you know, it's not easy to move it around. So they want you know, the furniture to be easy to move around to. But getting back to the homework assignment. This is a homework assignment. It's called divide in two screens, which is literally doing division in two screens. Okay? So I'll, I'll go ahead and describe what the homework is for. So you want to make sure that when you turn in, turn in the program called, turn in the project called divide two. Okay? Um, and also make sure that you turn in the AIA file and not the APK file, okay? Because when people turn in, you know, from the from exam one, I think two people turn in the APK file, which I cannot grade because I cannot see the source code because I grade by source code, and I cannot grade when I only have the APK file. All right. So with this homework assignment, the first screen is going to have the name of screen one, which is not even an option. You cannot change the name of screen one to something else. In this screen, you want to include or create two text boxes and at least two labels. You can have additional ones if you want to for additional you know, explanation purposes. One text box is for the end user to specify the dividend of a division. The other text box is used to specify the divisor of a division. The two labels are for, dis are for displaying the quotient and the remainder of the actual division operation. If you have questions about these terms, what is the dividend, what is the divisor, what is the quotient, and what is the remainder in the division, I suggest that you look it up on Wikipedia. Just look it up somewhere, okay? Because I don't, I think you know, these are things that people should understand when they're taking a programming class, okay? So if you don't, it's okay, it's not a big deal. No, I'm not gonna take any points off, but go ahead and find the resources to look, the, look up these particular items. And I think I got all of them spelled correctly. 
Did I misspell any words? Because that would make it harder to look up. I guess not these days. You know, Google can fix the spelling. <laughs> All I have to get is pretty close. Like I probably can spell quotient as K O um, T I E N T. It will still find it. Okay, so I'm just. I'm not going to do any further than this, okay? You can just highlight the section here, right click, and say search Google for quotient and remainder of a division, okay? That will explain, that will probably find the explanation of the other terms as well. But then there's one single paragraph that only has one sentence, which means it is important. But wait, don't do any division on this screen. So I want you to, to break it up into two screens where one screen let you enter the numbers and then the other screen would actually do the calculation, okay? So create a second screen, a second screen where the name is entirely up to you. I don't need, I don't need that name to be anything specific where it gets the number to divide from the first screen. So you need to pass that information from screen one to the second screen. The second screen should have a single button called, you know, divide an exclamation point. You guys can get more creative if you want to. You can use a bitmap or whatever. Upon pressing this button, compute the quotient and the remainder of the values entered in screen one and immediately return to screen one. In other words, you're going to get back from the second screen to screen one. When the app gets back to screen one, display the quotient and remainder from the other screen. Oh, okay. There should be not a, there should not be a one here but display the quotient and the remainder from the other screen. Now here are the restrictions. Your app cannot make use of files, TinyDB, Firebase DB, or any database component. You can make use of a web component in each screen, but only to use it for JSON decoding purposes. You can also borrow code from my own projects posted on Moodle. Okay? So that means, you know, the emphasis, okay, this is giving away half the homework assignment already. The emphasis is for you guys to make use of start value and also, I think it's called return value. I already wrote an app to illustrate that already, like some weeks ago. So what you need to do is to kind of dig it up and find out you know, how I got it accomplished. Is that okay? All right. So you do have two values to pass from screen one to the second screen and then two values to pass back. So you cannot just use a very sim simple you know, start value or a simple return value. You probably have to make use of a list to get this done. Okay. There are several ways to do it. You don't have to use a list, but, there are, but you do need to use the start value and the return value. All right, so are there any questions about uh, the homework assignment? Yep. Uh, you said you wanted us to submit it with the name of divide. Uh, Two. Two. Yep. Um, do, well, do you want our name nope. on there as well? Just nope, just like divide two is fine. Okay. Yep, because your name, I can get to it pretty easily. Because when I grade, you know, I'm grading, as I grade, it will display your name, and I will be able to use the rubric system to select, okay, this is done, this is done, this is not done, and so on. Oh. So it applies to only you as I grade it. So oh. they, they can all have the same name, it's not an issue. Okay. Yeah, but you know, good, good idea to think about it. If yeah. all the bounces were that way, uh, right? So. Yeah, but this one, you know, there's no need to do it. Yeah. All right. So, any other questions about the homework assignment? You have one week to do it. Okay. So, for the most part, if you forgot how to use the start value and the return value, you just have to look up, you know, that particular lecture. I'm pretty sure I got it re uh, recorded already. So look it up and watch it again if you need to. I might have uploaded some programs already that has that feature to pass information between the screens. I think I did. Um, so that's something you can also do, especially during the lab time after today's lecture. You know, I would just get you know get a head start on the project, look up you know the um, past projects and look up the videos just so that you can find it. All right. Any other questions? No other questions. So if there are no other questions, I am going to proceed with my project that I started the other day, which is the field target, you know, scorecard, you know, project. Okay. So I'm going to keep working on this project, you know, just so that you know I can illustrate, you know, different phases of the project. 
So what we did last time was we included or we specified a splash screen. Okay, so we can when the application starts, it has a splash screen. It has the option of letting end users to select a skip splash screen in the future. You know, just so that if people don't want to look at the splash screen because it wastes time, you know, they can jump right into the application. So we got that much done um, on Wednesday last week. Are there any questions about what we did last Wednesday? Okay. But the whole point, the original point of this app is to illustrate you know, how to you know, just capture these other screens that we that I need for this particular application because that's part of the homework assignment. Okay, is not to finish the actual program or the actual app, but at least be able to capture all the screens with all the controls that you need on each screen, so that you know. Okay, I think these screens will look like this because that will give you some points of attaching the actual code. Are we still doing okay so far? Okay, no questions. All right. So we'll go ahead and start with this one. You know, starting with the main screen. The main screen doesn't do a whole lot. All it does is to have two buttons here because there are only two choices. There might be some other choices later on in the quote unquote main screen, like you know, configure or edit a match or send a match data to a match director. So there might be some additional buttons later on. But at this point, I'm only focusing on Okay, let's start a new match, or you know, if the app or the phone crashes in the middle of a match, I want to be able to continue from a saved match. So are there any questions? Now the second option, which is uh, continue a saved match, is kind of interesting because that means you know, I need to have a way to one, remember that a match was actually in progress. And two, I have to remember at what point did the app or the phone crashed, so I can resume at that point. Is that making any sense? So that means you know, the app has to keep track of several things. It has to keep track of everything in the other screens and the state of the entire application. So if I go to you know, the top portion, which is a match configuration, Obviously, all of this data has to be maintained. The date of the match, uh, the name of the participant, the number of lanes, and the starting lane, they all have to be remembered as a part of whatever is saved in, with persistence related to this app. Okay. It also means the other screens, like um, lane configuration, the number of targets per lane for a, for a particular lane, and the number of tents per target of a particular lane also has to be remembered. And when we get down to you know, the scoring of a particular lane, the lane number, the target number, and the attempt number also needs to be remembered. Because this is the only way I can resume the match to exactly where I left off the previous time. So all of this stuff has to, remem has to be remembered. And I don't want to have a gazillion little you know, tags in TinyDB, so what I want to do is to use one gigantic list to include everything, to include the entire configuration of this match. Is that okay so far? You know, the concept of using a um, gigantic list to do this? Okay. All right. So now that we kind of know, you know what we are doing, there are two ways to get started with this project. You can get started with um, the bottom part, which is the you know, which is this particular screen, or you can talk, get started with the top part. Okay, so there are two ways to get started with this uh, with this project. Most people start with a top-down design approach, which means that they start with the main screen, and then you know they say, okay, when we start a new match, we have to get to the um, uh, match configuration screen. So let's see if we already have that code here. Yep, we do. So we have one you know, button that is fully functional already um, to get to the match configuration screen. Okay, so we'll proceed to the match configuration screen, which is by itself kind of interesting because it has a, um, a date picker, which means you, know, you can use this control or use this component to select a particular date. That is not difficult, okay? That's the easy part. The more difficult part is how do we want to represent that date in the database or in whatever the in the configuration of this match here. Okay. 
So let me kind of illustrate what I mean by that. Um, the question is, do you want to store a date the way it is easier to read for us, which is you know, the month, day of month, and then the year? Or do we want to store this in a way that is easier for the computer to process? Well, the answer depends on whether this date is only for display purposes, just for labeling, or do you want this date to actually be useful for calculation purposes? Okay. For instance, in some apps like yours, okay, you need to compute uh, the amount of time between a certain date and then today. So that means if you store dates, you know, internally as in a format that's easy for us to read, it becomes difficult to compute. Okay. In some other application where you store the date only for labeling, for end users to look at, then if you store in a very difficult or numerical representation internally, then every single time you present it, you have to convert it. Okay. So we, what we want to do, I personally think it is easier to store in, a, in a, just a number format. So let me go to the clock. And, tell, and let you guys you'll see what we can do with that. The clock is known as a sensor, which is kind of odd. In a way, it makes sense, but in a way, it's kind of odd too. And then what we'll do is we'll take a look at the clock and look at the match date and find out, you know, okay, how can those two components be related? In this case, this clock is not really used for timer purposes, so I'm going to turn off always fires and timer enabled. Now, maybe later on I will find a use for this, but at this point I don't have any needs to do that. So I'm going to turn off the, both of those features. In the blocks, I am going to specify or you know, take a look at the notifier related to my date picker. So let's go to the date picker first, and we'll take a look at what can be done with the date picker. Now what you can do with a date picker is after the date is set, okay, you can you can intercept this particular event. This is probably what you want to do most of the time. Is after the end user pick a particular date and click OK, you want to intercept that event and go like, okay, what am I going to do with this date? You may not have anything to do with it because you know if you just want to store that when you click start a match. That is nothing particularly that you need to do after the date itself is set. Okay. But what I really do want to show you is not what date picker can do, but what a clock can do. So I'm going to click on clock here. And we already know that we are not dealing with a timer event because I'm not interested in you know, getting a you know, something per second. I'm not interested in getting an event per second. Per second. What I do want to show you is what else, the, what, what other operations a clock can do. Um, it has the concept of an instant. Okay, this term here, an instant. So if you hover hover over it, you know, it, well, this one doesn't explain it. Now this is really kind of useful because it returns the text representing the date of an instant in the specified pattern. The instant is the internal representation of a date. So that is what we use internally to represent time. So in this case, it will convert the time, which is called internally, which is as a huge number, into a format that we know how to read. And you can specify you know, various options. The default is month day of month and then the year, but you can also select other options. Uh, format date time means you know, you're not only limiting to just the date, but you also have the time. Format time is you know, just you know, converting an instant into time. This one will get the milliseconds since 1970 from the instant, which is going to be a huge number. So the question now is, how do we get an instant? Well, this is one way to do it. So you can get an instant out of the uh, usual date format. You can also get it out of the number of milliseconds since 1970. And it also has a concept called now, which is, which is helpful. Because you know, this is basically just you know, um, the current time 
So whenever you call this subroutine, it will return the quote unquote instance representing the current time of the thumb. Is that okay? All right. So let's go ahead and take a look at what is an instant and see whether we can display that. Because if you cannot display it because it's not a number and it is not a string, you cannot store that into a list. Because you know, eventually we want to see whether an instant can be stored in a list so that we can retrieve and use it later. Does, that, does it make any sense? Okay. All right. Okay. So what we want to do is to go back to date picker and see what date picker can tell us. Because we need these two components to talk to each other. <coughs> so when you're dealing with date picker, you can get several properties from a date picker. You can get a text, which is going to be um, the, the text of the date that you have selected. But the nice thing is you can also get the instant representing the date that you have selected. So that is kind of nice because this means you know, those two components, the clock component and the date picker component, can actually talk to each other pretty easily. So, so what we'll do is we'll you know, run a quick test to see what, whether we, what an instant actually looks like. Is it a number or you know, is it even printable? So we go back to the designer. Well, we don't have to go back to the designer. We, we have some buttons already. So we'll hijack in the button one, you know, just so that we can use it to display what um, the date picker is using to represent the time. So we'll pick one of the labels. Okay, so let me see which label is useful. I'll just you know, drag in a new label for this particular quote unquote debug purposes. So I drag a new label over here as label four, switch back to the blocks, and then all I want to do is to say label four text is going to reflect the current time or the instant of the current time. So we'll set the text of label four to the date picker one time instant. So instant is right here. They do snap together, which is not a bad sign, okay? But we don't know whether it works or not. And we do have some warnings, so let's check out you know, what it's warning us about. Oh, okay, I see. I have one uh, button click here, and then I have the other one. So I cannot have two uh, event handlers per button. So I'm going to have to delete this block here. That, get, that got rid of all the warnings. Okay, so I think we are good to go. Now, what I do next is also something that you have to do for your homework assignment. This is now a multi-screen application, which means you cannot use the App Inventor internal interface to debug the application. You kind of have to start up an emulator on the side and then use the APK file for debugging the application. Okay? So when you do the homework assignment, you have to do the same thing. So what I'll do is I'm going to do the same thing as you know last time. I go to the Android SDK folder, go to the Platform Tools folder. Um, actually, I need to start an emulator first. So to start an emulator, I go back up one level, I go to tools, and there's a program called Android, and that's the pro the first program I need to run is Android, which starts up a user interface, a graphical user interface for everything. If there's anything to update, it will try to update it. Um, for some reason, you know, it's not uh, hooking up to, it cannot get the peer Okay, SSL peer unverified is not authenticated. Okay, so it's okay. I don't need to get it updated. We get to tools, we go to manage AVDs, and this will present you the screen to start up a particular virtual machine. I think I also demonstrated how to create the AVDs to begin with. So if you forget how to do it, you can refer back to the earlier you know, video that I showed you guys how to 
create your own AVD, which stands for Android Virtual Device, which is just an emulator. Okay. So I'm going to use the same one that I used last time and start it up. Um, none of these options you should you should probably just you know not you know, select these options unless you have a particular reason to do it. So this will start up the virtual machine, which will automatically be quote unquote connected to the host, which is you know, what I'm running right now. So I'm going to switch back to the command line interface as the virtual machine starts. Uh, use another screen here to go to platform tools and start up ADV server. Okay. You can do this also in Windows. You know, if you use CMD in Windows, you can start up a command line. You probably have to dig around a little bit just to find out you know, where um, the Android SDK is installed. But once you locate where it's installed, you can use almost exactly the same commands. So this is starting up. I'm going to start the server first. Press the enter key. It's not connecting yet. Okay, if I do a ADB um, devices, it won't find it at this point. Oh, it already finds it. Okay, that's pretty quick. And since I already have most of this stuff here you know, up and running, I switch back to the browser. Where's my browser? There we go. So we switch switch back to the browser, and we'll go ahead and use build, not connect anymore. So we'll build an APK file, and then later on we'll upload the APK file to the virtual machine. If you have an actual real device for debugging, the QR code is probably a whole lot easier because you don't need to start up the virtual machine and use ADB to do every, anything. You just you know, point your camera to the screen and click, and there you go, you get the file. So this is a little bit more difficult, but it does not require an actual device to do it. So it should give me an option to save the file, just like that. And you also, hopefully, you remember from last time, you know why I, um, how I configured the browser so that it will just save the file. If I already have a file of the same name, it will tell me, okay, do you want to overwrite that file? So right here, I just save the file, go back to the command line here, and then just use adb install the dash r for reinstalling if the application is already installed. And then all you have to do is to provide the path to the file name itself. There we go. So now we just upload and install the application into the virtual machine. It's all done. Switch back to the virtual machine, which is this one here. Since the app is already installed, I can find it here. Okay. I know people in the back may not see this very easily, but it's at the bottom of the screen. Now I start up my application, start a new match, and specify a match date. It is automatically you know, select is it's automatically selecting today's date, which is good. You click OK. And this button doesn't do anything except to update label four to reflect the current date chosen by match date and is not doing it. Okay. Alright. So if it's not doing it, I'm going to check one thing first, okay? because what I want to do is to make sure that I did not make a mistake here. Text box one. Oh, I put it into the wrong box. OK. Um, let's find out where the other. I did. So. All right, fine. I got it. Okay. It probably has multiple ones again. <laughs> this reminds me when I graded your. Oh, I don't want it there. I want these to be gone, not in the backpack. Now I have. <laughs> okay, fine. We'll just delete. 
The elite. The elite. Um, there are still in the backpack. No, no, no. It's okay to wear to, to be in the backpack. As long as it's not out here, it's okay. Which, uh, which race in Doctor Who you know, keeps saying, delete, delete, delete? Does anyone watch Doctor Who? No. Daleks. No, no, no. Daleks are a little bit more extreme. They say exterminate. The ones that say delete are the Cybermen. The Cybermen say delete because you know they are, um, they always go out. They're basically the Borg, you know, the the equivalents of the Borg from Star Trek. So they they go out, they seek you know humans, and then they convert humans into Cybermen. So the delete you know refers to the deletion of the consciousness of the original person. So they become you know, when they become Cybermen, they join the called the collective. So they they can no longer think for themselves. Okay. All right. So now that we have the right uh, event handler, we just need to attach the code to it. This one here. Take this out, we don't need that anymore. This is the problem with working with a tiny little screen area. The screen area is not small, it's just that you know, since I have everything zoomed in, it's, it's a little bit, uh, it's a little bit harder to navigate. There we go. Okay, so we'll build it again because I made that mistake of associating it to the wrong <coughs> spot. I probably can just run the app just differently because I just you know, I just need to trigger that event to happen, right? You know, so I can go to the text box and just leave the text box. It will still do it. Let me let me try that. Okay, so I think it's this box here. So I just need to give it something and then switch over. There we go. Okay, so now we have an idea of uh, what the, an instance looked like. So an instance look looked like this, which is java.util, Gregorian, calendar, and so on. You know, let, let me cancel the other one. I don't really, well, I suppose I can just save it too. Okay, save, <laughs> overwrite. Okay, fine. Okay, there we go. So getting back to what an uh, instance looked like is this. Okay. In other words, the first part you know, indicates what kind of thing it is, and then it has the square bracket, and then close the square bracket here. And then whatever is in between, they are specified with something, and then the name of whatever the attribute is equals to something, and then the comma, and so on, okay? But the problem with this is you cannot convert it back. This is the text representation, but once you have the text representation, you cannot interpret it back to be an instance. Okay, so uh, how do we know that? You know, how do we know that it cannot be converted back once it is represented as text? So let's try an experiment. Okay, in other words, what I'll do is I'm going to use the label, the, the text of this label, and try to read it back into another. Um, well, I can I can read it back into uh, match date um, to see whether that may not work. Because all I all I want to do is to check whether this can be read back correctly and be interpreted as an instance again. Ultimately, I want to test for you guys to see. Okay, if you need to represent date and store that in your application, can you store a date using an instant? And last time I tried this, you know, there was no way to you know, store a time, store time as an instant um, because there's no way to reverse this back to uh, an instance. This is in text representation right now. Okay, so we'll go ahead and see you know, whether we can you know, look at this big mess here and reverse it back into an instance. And to do that, we can go back to designer and we'll go ahead and label for is fine. We'll we'll just change the program to test this little feature. Go back to blocks and this time Okay, I really do need more space on the screen to do this. Okay, so I'm just gonna move this one down here. So we'll take this out, and what we'll do is we'll use a variable 
and use a local variable to store that information. All right, and then what we want to do is to see if we can change this time, and we'll change the name of this variable. So it's not just generic as name, we'll change it to time. So the idea is to kind of change, see if we can change this time back and use it as an instant. set label for the text of label for to not time but to change it to a particular representation of the time so we need access to the clock itself okay I think something is Oh, there we go. We have that scroll bar here. So we want to change the instant back to a time representation. We're getting pretty close. This one works okay. So we can. Okay, where did it go? And then we use the current time as the instant. There we go. All right. So now this app, you know, when I click the, the button, is going to do something slightly different. It will first, you know, get the instant from the date picker, and then store that into a local variable. And then after that, I will use that local variable and immediately use it as an instant and try to convert it back into a um, a format that people can understand more readily. And I'm suspecting this is going to work. So let's try this out. So how to represent time is going to be important in several apps that I have seen you guys you know, suggesting. Um, like the snow shoveling app is going to be useful too because you want to record when a request was made. If a request was made last year, you probably want to do something and say, okay, it's no longer you know, active. Do you need to time out you know, requests? Is that making any sense? Yeah, but see, like, the thing is that the way that mine works is that they usually have it set up so that, so that there will only be requests for within about probably like a 24 hour window. Okay, but then you still need the concept of within 24 hours. Yeah, so, okay, so the, so, the, so the thing would be that I does the same way that it's done with Uber and also Lyft, so basically do they work a lot different because, 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 so those are done right on the fly, right, or no? What? Uh, Uber and Lyft. Google what? Uh, Uber and also Lyft, you know, like with the, okay. with the Uber app. Yeah. Are like those done on the fly or basically like are those? Okay, what do you mean by on the fly? Okay, so basically, like, oh, okay, basically, like, um, what, when you go into Uber, mm -hmm. um, you basically say, okay, um, I, um, I basically want to set up my location for pickup. Yeah. So then after that, once you go through the process, you say, okay, I want to, they will basically give you a price range. They say, okay, it's going to be between, that's it, between 10 and 12 dollars. Right, right. So you, you send in the request, you send, you basically say that I need a ride. Yeah, if you need a ride, they will give you a price range that's it. $12. Okay. Then after that, once you say accept, they'll say, okay, there's a car on the way. Well, right that depends way. on whether there is a car nearby. If you're in the middle of Nebraska, there may not be anyone responding to your request. Yeah. Okay, so, okay, so basically, like, for that one, there is only usually a 24 hour window, right? Or I do not know. With Uber, does it does it actually look at the cars already available around you before it does anything to your request? Like, no. okay, if you're in the middle of Nebraska, okay, and in the middle of the night, in the middle of Nebraska, when nobody's going is driving Uber, 
you know, for the next you know month or so in the middle of winter. Okay, when you start up your Uber app, does it just tell you right away that nobody is available? No. Right? Okay. Um, basically, the way that it works is okay. that the way that it works is that well, when you basically send a request, they basically a person who's an Uber driver will like to say, will, will basically get that pop up on their screen saying this person has just requested a ride. So then you can say, okay, I have to accept. Okay. So I'm not. Sure so yeah, so it doesn't work where it tells you, okay, like there's no one in your area or whatever. Okay, but then does Uber say anything about, you know, if no one can answer your request, if no one can meet your request within a certain amount of time, yeah, you know, the request will automatically time out and disappear? I'm not sure because I've never gotten that far. Because otherwise, the next time you go through Nebraska to go on a road trip, you know, you and you turn on your Uber, then you'll see all these historical messages that are from a year ago that somebody needed a ride a year ago at that location. <laughs> yeah, I don't think that's going to happen. I think Uber has its own. The server, you know, has a mechanism to purge requests probably, that have timed out. Probably, but I'm not sure. But that's not a that's that's a logic that you have to implement in your app because it, it's not it's not done automatically. Okay. Okay? okay. All right. So getting back to this example here. Okay. So it, it works okay. In other words, if I just store an instant into a local variable, I can use it immediately as an instant. Not a problem. Okay. So in this case, I'm going to try something different now. Okay. I will make use of a list because this is ultimately what we want to do is to use a list to represent items. So when I use this as a list, I'm going to create a list with only one item. Okay, take that away with only one item, which is the instant. So now I have a list of exactly only one item inside, which is an instant, which also means it, when I get back to here, I cannot just use the local variable time. I have to read, I have to say the first item of this list. Okay, so we go to um, well, pick a random item. It's going to work because the entire list only has one item. So, I'm, but I'm not going to do that tricky thing. I'm going to say select list item. The list is time itself. The index is one because there's only one item in this list. Okay, doesn't like that. <coughs> one. One. There we go. And why is still still complaining? Let's get rid of that. Oh, I did it again. I think I. Oh, it's complaining about this slot being empty. Okay. But this one doesn't have a warning anymore, so we think we're good to go. All right, so before I go again, you know, I just want to make sure everybody understands what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is to test whether you can store an instant as a member of a list, and then later on retrieve that from a list and reuse it as just an instant, okay? Because last time I tried something like this, it didn't work, which also means if you need to store time internally, you have to store that in milliseconds since 1970, okay? But we'll give it a try first, okay? We'll see whether this works now because you know it has changed quite a bit since the last time I used it. So we'll go ahead and give it one more try. If this works this time, we're good to go. If it doesn't work, that means you have to convert everything to milliseconds since 1970 in order to store that in your database. Okay, skip the file, just overwrite the file already there. Go back to the command line, and you can see once you set up the command line, it's not that difficult to use. Just up arrow and just rerun the same command. Okay, so go back to the emulator and start up again. Go to the same place. 
I intentionally change the date a little bit, you know, just so that we don't accidentally get it from somewhere else. Click. Oh, okay, still works. Okay, so I think they have fixed that issue, you know, since the last time I tested this. So this also means, you know, when you need to store time in your application, instant is can be stored as a part of a list now, which is great. Okay, that actually is a great thing. All right, so we got that issue, you know, handled. Um, so the next thing we need to do is to maintain um, a key value pair list.